Thank you very much. So I'm glad we have uh, all this session in English, or as uh, Professor Veronese used to say in European School of Oncology, the official language of European School of Oncology is bad English. <laughs> all right, so it's my great, great pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank the organizers, especially I'll tell their names in the Greek language because the names are Greek. So this is Evgenia and this is Galini. This is how we call in Greece these two. And Galina actually is as well a Greek name? I didn't know it. Well, really? Greek, really? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. I've missed it, sorry. Galini means peace. Ah, yeah. peace, yeah, okay. And Evgenia means no. polite. Yeah, polite. Okay. That's but I, I'm not, story. but it's not about me, yeah. So Sorry. you're learning some Greek today. Dear friends, I'm going to cover a very crucial and essential topic. And this is education and career development in especially medical oncology in Europe. I would like first, before going to the real education in career development, to the undergraduate education. There, we have done universally, worldwide, great mistakes. So I'm going to raise three questions. Where do we stand today regarding undergraduate education in oncology? I would say that oncology education, it is underemphasized and also fragmented, or not only in Europe, but probably in all over the world. Most medical students never do a clinical rotation in oncology, and medical students are a long way from reaching the standard uh, knowledge and skills re required in oncology. Question number two, why we need urgently to improve our education in medical students. These are the reasons, I believe. First of all, that the mortality from cancer remains quite high. Some specialties, like medical oncology, are rapidly evolving. Junior doctors themselves are exhibiting decline oncology knowledge and, of course, declining skills. And we have unfortunately, lack of adequate oncology mentoring in academic medicine. And the third question is, what we are going to do now? I believe that we have to reform the undergraduate curriculum. We have to teach our students oncology and giving them as many skills as we can. We have to make sure that our students are seeing cancer patients, examining cancer patients, and discussing cancer patients. And also, I think that since the last, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years, there are some extracurriculum oncology initiatives by some other form, like European School of Oncology, European Society of Medical Oncology, blah, blah, blah. So it's nice every summer if we can push our students to go there. I don't know if any of you had the chance to, to, to be educated in such summer schools. I think it is an excellent idea. Okay, so let's move now to the training in medical oncology in Europe. I would, uh, I would uh, discuss extensively the ESMO-ASCO global curriculum, since I used to be, and I'm very uh, honored about that. I was the chairman of uh, the ESCO, ASCO, ESMO, ASCO Global Curriculum at ESMO for a couple of years. And for those who, are, who want to go to oncology, of course you have in mind always two things, the pros and the cons. The pros are that cancer is of course a common disease, morbidity is high, and we need well trained oncologists, especially medical oncologists. 
is an area where you can do lots of research, starting from basic research, translational research, up to clinical research. But they have also some cons, like you have to break the bad news to the patients, burnout syndrome is around, and patients' final outcome is not always successful. All right, so let's go to the history of ESMO ASCO Global Curriculum. You all know that in 1965 already in the United States, medical oncology was established as a separate uh, specialty. In 1989, ESMO started for the first time this certification, trying to give an examination program to medical oncologists, European medical oncologists. In 2004, a joint ESMO ASCO task force established, and this was the first global core curriculum initiative. It was published first time in Annals of Oncology in 2004 and in JCO, and a logbook was launched. You know what logbook is, right? Huh? You know? Okay. And of course, it was translated in 11 languages, 11 different languages. Except Russian, I guess. I think so. Yeah, you are right. In, in 2005, medical oncology was recognized by European Union. And I'll go to the uh, time you have to spend in, in order to get this specialty in my next slides. And in 2010, the global curriculum as well as the logbook have been updated. And in 2016, we have a new edition of Global Curriculum, which is uh, this one here. This is the 2010, and then we have the 2016. Have you ever seen it? Huh? It's beautiful. It's divided in a number of uh, different... This is the, the logbook. This is the edition of 2017. And this is divided in several sections and subsections, chapters and subchapters, written by uh, ESMO uh, writers as well as ASCO writers. So let's see now why do we need a global curriculum, especially in Europe. I believe that we need internationally to have accepted recommendations for clinical training in medical oncology. We should talk the same language in all over Europe as far as oncology is concerned. We have to facilitate greater mobility of medical oncologists to work around Europe. You've been educated in Russia, now you want to go and work in Greece. Why not? If you have the same training, then this is possible. Also, to cope with the variability of training in medical oncology, to assist the recognition of medical oncology as a specialty, unique specialty in Europe, and also for the patients. It's nice for a patient who lives in another country, but is not originated from there, and he has to stay there or to move somewhere else. He has to be treated with the same way. Then this is a complete program which is part of the global curriculum. You start with two, three years training in internal medicine. I'll be very tough here saying that keep in mind you cannot become an efficient medical oncologist unless you have an adequate background in internal medicine. I know my, my friend Matteo from Italy disagree on that, but <laughs> do you? You still? Yeah, I agree. I think it's hard to do medical uh, internal medicine, but it's it's very important, and it's it's also changed in Italy. So we now do a year and a half. Yeah, it is very very important to have internal medicine before, and then to go for a fellowship in medical oncology for two or three years, and you have there to rotate in different departments to listen to lectures, to have journal clubs or CPCs or whatever. 
you have to be involved with the MDTs to follow the clinical practice guidelines and to try to participate in clinical trials and if possible to do some translational research at least for six months during your training. And at the end of the day, you have to have your examination. This is the first uh, uh, paper published in Annals in 2004. And these are the recommendations for the global curriculum in medical oncology, signed by both Europeans and Americans, ESMO and ASCO. And here we have the examination. This is very essential. As you know, ESMO has established an examination which will be certified by, uh, for five years, a written examination for two and a half hours with 100 multiple choice questions, and the pass score is 60%. And I'm sure some of you have already passed it. Can I see your hands? Unfortunately, no. Oh. So we had several oncologists, as far as I know, some uh, from Moscow and from St. Petersburg. They, they tried, but I'm not sure that they passed. I'm sorry, Professor, to say that, but that's true. <laughs> but at least you tried. They tried. So we are working on it. But, you know, in, for Russia, it's just to upgrade your CV, not more. So what we can do is ESMO examination. We, we can do, so CME is not accepted here in Russia. So it's no. just to upgrade your CV. Yeah, that's exciting examination, but you know, there is uh, no profits in our career development here in Russia, but it doesn't mean that we are not gonna, you know, pass it, but it's just upgrade your CV. Maybe I'm wrong, colleagues, tell me if someone passed as my no, exam. This is, this is a very, very important uh, point. The only countries in Europe where the certification of examination, if you have it in your hands, you don't need to do it again in your country, are only two countries. This is Switzerland and Slovenia. In the rest of the countries, you have also to take an exam in your country, a national exam. So it would be nice if this is enough for everybody. Yeah. I remember I took, I took this exam ages ago, I was a, for probably the, in the first group in 1990 something. And at that time, there were no more than 60 participants from all over the world. Nowadays, you take, as you know, the ESMO in Europe, in Cairo, in India, so you're moving around, so yeah, at the same time. All right, so. The problem now is the discrepancy between medical oncology training in different European countries. And this is uh, the first attempt we had in ESMO when I was chairing the committee. The ESMO ASCO Global Curriculum and the Evolution of Medical Oncology Training. And you will see some very interesting things here. Tremendous experience we got, we didn't know that. And uh, this is a map of Europe, as you understand. And you see only with blue are countries where medical oncology is recognized. But I, I'm going in more details on that. Show me you know, this table. There are only 23 countries in all over Europe where medical oncology has been recognized. It was recognized, it's still recognized as subspecialty in Netherlands and Turkey. Has a mixed representation with radiation oncology in around eight countries, Albania, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Moldova, blah, blah. Mixed with hematology, like in Austria or in Germany. Not recognized at all, including Russia, and not clear like Georgia or whatever. So this is the situation in Europe. And I heard, uh, not today only, but the other time I was here, from uh, my friends here that still Russia not, don't have medical oncology recognized at all. And look at this interesting collection of data. This is the number of years in internal medicine around Europe. Duration of zero to two years, 
21 countries are doing that, and this is the 60% of the European countries. Three to five years, 13 countries, which means 37%, and six years duration, one country, and this is Austria. This is a little bit too much to have six years in general medicine, but they overdoing it here. So most of the countries having something like two to three years in general medicine. And then we move to how many years of medical oncology you need. Up to one year only, there are six countries. It's only 17%, including Russia. Two years in general medicine, eight countries, almost 23%. Three years of medical oncology in 15 countries, it's almost 43%. And four years in uh, medical oncology makes 17%. So this is the situation in Europe. We are not unified. We don't have common uh, regulations. So this is something which should be uh, done sometime so we can talk the same language. And these are the final results of our landscape. Medical oncology is recognized in only 23 European countries. In nine countries was adopted and in seven countries was adapted. And in 51 oncology societies in Europe, ESMO ASCO recommend recommendation for a global curriculum has been endorsed. And you see here lots of countries, including Russia. After you, you've done with your, with your training in medical oncology, you can become an academician, you can become a practitioner in, in a cancer center or in an institute, you can practice in public general hospital or you can go to private practice. And now this is the third part of my talk, which is how to plan a further successful career in medical oncology, trying to get help from some other bodies, such like ESMO or European School of Oncology. So how can ESMO help you in your oncology career? ESMO offers you the global curriculum, ESMO offers you the ESMO examination, the recertifications and the CME, workshops and courses, ESMO preceptorship program, young oncology education, and oncology fellowships. And let's see here ESMO oncology fellowship can be done in translational research, or in translational visits, or in palliative care, or the famous Georges Maté translational research program, clinical research, and visit clinical units. These are the characteristics of ESMO fellowships up to now. Since 1999, since 1989, sorry, 432 ESMO fellowships were given from 63 countries, hosted in 95 institutes. Total investment of, from ESMO part was 7 million euros. And the types of ESMO fellowships you can get is research fellowship. They've done, they've done that in 133 uh, young medical oncologists, 242 for unit visits, 36 for palliative care fellowships, and five for the Georges Maté fellowship. And now let's see how European School of Oncology can help you. European School of Oncology can offer you educational courses, can offer you educational master classes, fellowships, 
the so-called clinical training centers program, and I'll come in detail to that, and certificate of certificates of competence program. Well, and also the e-learning program. Do you know the e-learning program? Every Thursday, you sit down with your computer and you listen to a beautiful lecture, lasting for one hour. And let's go to see what the Kilka Training Centers program is. This is the fellowship program of European School of Oncology to trainees who have been specialized within the last five years or for those who will complete their specialization by the start of the fellowship. And they can enroll either as a visiting observer, which is uh, training for three or six months with a grant of 2,000 euros per month, or going for a visiting practitioner status, which means you do work like a trainee in this country, again for three or six months with the same money. And since 2019, we have some uh, countries, some centers from Eastern Europe uh, giving also uh, training for in, in the frame of this uh, program. And how we select the people? Candidates, candidates should already participate at least in one uh, ESO event, and especially masterclass. Candidates should come from either Europe, including Russia, Latin America, or Mediterranean African countries. Candidates need to provide CV with publication, if existed, motivation letter, a letter of recommendation, your diploma, and proof of specialization. And candidate, candidates should demonstrate the uh, competence in English, mainly. And this is the competence program. European School of Oncology has a cooperation last year with some very well-known European universities where they can offer you a diploma of competence on three topics so far, breast cancer, lung cancer, or lymphoma. And how can you get this certificate? By joining this university. The duration, for example, for lymphoma is 14 months. Totally, you need 405 hours and 14 European credit transfer uh, system points. In breast cancer, again, you join the Ulm University in Germany with a duration of 13 months. You require three seminars and five modules, totally 381 hours and 13 ECTS. And last but not least is the, comp the competence program on lung cancer with the Zurich University in uh, Switzerland with 12 months duration and you need totally 420 hours and 14 ECTS. And this is all about medical oncology. A few words about radiation and surgical oncology. Radiation oncology curriculum in Europe was developed in 2011 by ESTRA. It may be practiced as an independent oncological specialty or may be integrated with other oncology uh, training. The training period should be at least five years, full-time or if part-time, an equivalent period. And at least 6% of, of the program must be spent on uh, clinical work. And then we have the surgical oncology in Europe. In 2016, a global curriculum, a curriculum has been developed. And this is the program to, be, to become a surgical oncology officially. And uh, it is initially a kind of global curriculum where you might have training in general surgery before, and then you can specialize of minimum of three years, no, no, three years of general surgery followed by 
a kind of fellowship in a center of in a center of excellence for two years in several topics in several areas like breast, uh, GI, hip, liver or pancreas or endocrine cancers. So these are the two things. I just uh, put it in just not to talk only about medical oncology, but also to give you some information about radiation oncology and surgical oncology. Okay, I think having said that, I would like to thank you, and we can open discussion now or later. Thank you so much, Professor, for great presentation. Uh, maybe you remember that I told you before that our residents and young doctors, they are quite familiar with asthma. We really like to apply for asthma preceptorship. And uh, we attend a lot uh, these conferences, this one, two days as well. Our doctors, they uh, attended ESO fellowship. So yeah, uh, our young doctors are quite familiar with ESO asthma perspectives that they provided. And of course, we know that we need to work on our specialization. And as far as I know, next year, our Ministry of Healthcare decided to divide our three specialty from general, let's say, oncology to medical, surgery, etc. So, yeah, we are working on it and hope the situation will, so, will be solved soon. And for how many years training you are talking about? Still two. No, up to three. Up to three. Up to Sorry, three I was years. wrong. Yeah. Together? Yeah. In the own medicine plus medical yeah. oncology? Yeah. And unfortunately, I think it's, you know, not really a good thing that we still don't have uh, obligatory to undergo internal medicine before medical oncology. So personally, I did internal medic me medicine because I, of course I realized that it's impossible to understand medical oncology without internal medicine. But you know, still it's not uh, obligatory, let's say, to become medical oncologist. I'm sorry to say that again. All the time I disappeared you. Yeah, <laughs> disappointed. Disappointed. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but so, every time you're giving me some different explanation and <laughs> some different <laughs> justification, I remember last time you said it is impossible to get to find money to train someone for five years. Yeah, and that's true. It is correct. It's correct because you know our government covered just some of uh, uh, residents' education, and that's it. Other residents have to pay for the education. Can and you don't get salary no, meanwhile. They don't get I cannot, salary. Not. I cannot, that's a disaster. Yeah. yeah, this is a problem. It's no problem. I think it's a disaster. Did you know? Because that? there is no motivation for our young doctors. You know. Oh yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, so, uh, yeah, so, do you want to no, say no, something? No. Sure. First, question, no, no, no. first question. Ah, first question. First question to professor, no? Yeah, Please. do we okay. have a microphone here? You can ask either in Russian or in English, so. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I would like to ask you, uh, about the benefits of the uh, certificates, and uh, which certificates are uh, are preferred. So uh, I don't understand the difference between asthma certificates and, uh, for example, uh, specialized like breast uh, cancer certificate. No, these are two completely different things. What ESMO does is to give you the opportunity to go to examination. And if you pass the examination, you get the title of medical oncologist in Europe. This doesn't mean that your country is going to accept that. That's why I said before, there are only two countries in Europe where the ESMO certificate is valid. In the rest of the countries, you have to take a national exam. This is one part. The other part is probably you mix the certificate European School of Oncology gives you if you go in for a fellowship or for the competence program. So this is a different thing. This doesn't count for you to get the title of a medical oncologist, but it gives you some more benefits, some more credits that you have done something more in life somewhere else. You spend two, three, four, six months where you get some training and this is the, what European School of Oncology does. 
There is nothing between them and there is nothing between these two and your country. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for your answer. And uh, one more question. So, uh, for the first certificate, uh, the ESMO certificate, I think, uh, if I uh, if I have my training here in Russia and afterwards I pass this uh, examination, uh, I am um, I'm eligible to work uh, in uh, Switzerland and Slovenia or not? Not. So I, no. I still have to, uh, yeah. okay. You know what the, what the issue here is? I don't know if Matteo can help me because I don't remember. I think that ESMO accepts you to take part in the exam regardless if you have training with two or three years internal medicine plus two or three years medical oncology. What actually they need is for you to have at least more than, I think, three years of medical oncology experience. Mm. Correct me if I'm... Yes, yes. I think so. This is what I remember. Yes. Okay. So you can take part in the ESMO exam without mm -hmm. having the regular program mm -hmm. of medical oncology. Yeah, okay, thank you.